Maybe you can take a break. <laughs> Oh, is it? Okay, looks like. So maybe you can learn how to do that also. Thanks. Okay, looks like it's resolved. Let's hide this. Yeah, I think I can see it also. That's good. Okay, let's get started. Uh, well, as usual, Fridays are the really interested people days, let's say. <laughs> Or maybe he put people who don't want to go out of Zurich days, <laughs> but this is the last time, uh, so you won't be you won't do it again. Uh, it's the start of the summer. That's good, uh, and we'll end with a uh, really exciting topic. I think every lecture is exciting here. How many people agree with that? <laughs> okay, so <laughs> we have a contingent over here that's excited, and some people may not be expressing their excitement. I don't know. <laughs> Everybody is different, right? <laughs> Okay, so uh, we'll talk about virtual memory. Uh, yesterday, we talked about prefetching. Today, we'll talk about virtual memory. I'll briefly wrap up prefetching, but these are ideas that were initially developed in 1960s. Actually, a lot of ideas were developed in 1960s. Prefetching evolved a lot over the course of 60 plus years. We have very sophisticated prefetching mechanisms today in machines. Virtual memory is a different story. It did not evolve that much, let's say. The basic ideas are very, very similar to what they were in 1960s. Uh, they work, but they may not work extremely well. You will see that there's a lot of complexity, a lot of overhead in virtual memory. Like before I start, uh, uh, have you seen virtual memory in any other class so far? Not yet, right? Okay, so that's going to be completely new. Did you see prefetching in any other, any other class? Okay, that's good. Maybe one of the, one of you saw somewhere. Okay, yeah, virtual memory you'll see in uh, in the second uh, year when you talk about systems programming, for example. But this is. Uh, 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 this is an area where system and architecture interfaces a lot, as you will see. But also keep in your mind that this is not doing very well today uh, because of issues that we will maybe talk about at the very end uh, of this lecture. So I have a lot of slides actually in this lecture. Uh, we'll see how many of them we will cover. Okay, so remember that you have an extra assignment. It'd be good to do it. Uh, and this is the MDOS paper. This is actually almost half of the assignment here. Copied, pasted. Uh, but uh, I also give you another extra credit assignment. I would recommend uh, this paper that I wrote. It's only four pages, also very short, basically, three pages of content. So you can get one more percent extra credit if you do that review. That's a lot, I think. You get 5% if you do all of the assignments. Uh, and you don't need to worry that much about passing the course, let's say. Okay, so this is the paper, and it's a short reading, uh, as I said. Uh, it covers some, some things we did not talk about, but some things we did talk about also. Okay, so this paper discusses uh, like data-centric, data-driven, and data-aware architectures, and I'll let you figure out what those are uh, by reading the paper. Okay, so today we're going to do a virtual memory, and uh, your, your uh, Harris and Harris actually has a chapter, sub-chapter dedicated to it. It's a good one. I'll actually uh, use some content from it, but these readings also cover it. Uh, there are also some recommended readings. If you're interested, you can take a look at it. Uh, the last one over here is a, a critique of existing virtual memory systems. Uh, basically, uh, it, it talks about the issues with existing virtual memory systems and how can we fix those issues. But of course, that may be done better after you understand virtual memory clearly. Okay, so let's wrap up prefetching first. Uh, I'll go through this relatively quickly. Uh, basically, this is what we did not cover at the end. Uh, we built a lot of prefetching algorithms. We discussed a lot of them, but real systems have many prefetches, basically hybrid prefetchers. They use multiple prefetches to cover many different memory access patterns. And this gets you a better prefetch coverage and potentially better timeliness as well. Because if one prefetch is not timely in covering one pattern, uh, then another prefetch may be timely. So hybrid prefetches, the idea of heterogeneous hybrid prefetches, just like hybrid branch predictors, hybrid cache management policies also exist here. Of course, whenever you, you, add, uh, you add more things, you get more complexity and many more design and optimization decisions that you need to make. This is also more bandwidth intensive because more prefetchers are now requesting stuff from memory uh, or the memory hierarchy. And prefetchers also start interfering with each other. They get 
uh, they start stepping on each other's toes basically by sending requests that delay each other's requests, right? Basically, they contend with each other for memory bandwidth, cache space, et cetera. So you need to really manage accesses from each prefet. And I think this is a fascinating topic also. And things become more complicated when you have multi-threaded, multi-processor systems. Now there are multiple issues, multiple other issues that come into play, like prefetching shared data. If processors are sharing data, how do you prefetch them? If you don't prefetch them at the right time, you may actually incur additional co coherence misses and invalidations because you prefetch some uh, cache block and somebody else is going to write to that cache block. You prefetch it into your cache only for that cache block to be invalidated without you using it, right? And these are issues actually that you need to be careful about in a multiprocessor system. And prefetching efficiency becomes a lot more important because you have more processors contending for the memory bandwidth. Memory bandwidth is more precious, in other words, and cache space is more valuable because you have more things requiring it. And as I said, one course prefetch interfere with others at many different levels. And we've seen actually all of these memory hierarchy levels. So now you should hopefully be comfortable with what is written on the slide. Okay, I will not go into a lot of detail, just except to say that there's a lot of research that has been done in this area. And a lot of research goes into products as well. I personally, as I mentioned yesterday, have done a lot of research in prefetching. And these are some of the papers that we wrote, for example, uh, like how to make it bandwidth efficient, how to have hybrid prefetching systems, how do you control the prefetches in a coordinated manner? Uh, how do you design the multi-core resources to uh, have shared resource management? How do you do the DRAM memory controllers to be aware of prefetches? Because there are interesting issues, like, like this basic issue is, do you prioritize prefetch requests or demand requests? Right? Demand requests is the request, a load request from a core. We prioritize a pre prefetch request. Sometimes prioritizing a prefetch request makes sense, actually, if that prefetch request is going to complete soon or better utilize your memory bandwidth by hitting in the row buffer. So basically the decisions you make are actually very important for the performance of the systems. And there are many, many other interesting things that you can find. And at some point it becomes interesting to design the caches and the prefetches together. This paper tries to do that. And there's room for prefetching in GPUs also, but you need to be even more careful on a GPU actually. If you do prefetching on a GPU, uh, memory bandwidth is even more precious because GPUs are very bandwidth intensive, right? Uh, access patterns may be predictable. That's the good part. Uh, but if you make a mistake, you're wasting bandwidth that some other thread may utilize, basically. And that bandwidth is even more important. Okay, so I will not go into a lot of detail. I, clearly, you can see that I'm fascinated by this topic, uh, like many other topics in architecture. But you can find a lot more information online, as I mentioned uh, yesterday. These are slides that I copied from yesterday. Okay, any questions on prefetching? Okay, now let's jump into virtual memory. I think one lecture on virtual memory will not do complete justice to the topic, but hopefully I'll give you the overview uh, of uh, main issues in virtual memory. And this slide you remember, hopefully, from before. Before we went into memory organization and technology, like the first memory lecture, I said, this is the programmer's view of memory, right? You do loads and stores to memory and they get serviced somehow. And then we said, let's go into the physical memory system. I actually showed you the next slide also, which I'm going to show right now, like, and then the next slide as well. And uh, we said that basically ideal memory has this characteristics, zero latency, infinite capacity, zero cost, infinite bandwidth. And we kind of tried to achieve that with the memory hierarchy. Virtual memory, still we would like these characteristics, but virtual memory especially concerns itself with the capacity part. Basically is the programmer, if you have limited physical memory capacity, how do you give the illusion to the programmer that it's not limited, let's say. That's the idea. But latency is still important, as we will see. OK, so basically, this slide you have also seen. I actually used this slide early on before we started covering physical memory in detail. I said programmer sees virtual memory. And they can assume the memory is infinite because of this abstraction provided by virtual memory. In reality, physical memory is not clearly infinite. It's much smaller than what the virtual memory provides, meaning programmer assumes. But system, system meaning system software and hardware together cooperatively, maps virtual memory addresses to physical memory addresses. There's an injection layer basically between virtual to physical addresses. And the system automatically manages this physical memory space that's real. So physical memory space is real, virtual memory space is not real, right, in a sense. I mean, uh, addresses are real, but memory doesn't exist uh, in the sense that programmer just assumes it. But physical memory is much smaller than that, and the system automatically manages to give the illusion that the larger virtual memory seems to exist from, exist from the programmer's perspective. And the good, good news about this is programmer does not need to know the size of the physical memory now. They don't need to manage it. 
You never, when you write programs, for example, is there some problem? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Oh, in this, yeah, in this case, it's the operating system. Yeah, it's, it's like Windows, for example, or Mac OS. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there, there are other memory management mechanisms that uh, virtual machines like JVM uh, have. Uh, and actually, uh, they, they introduce another layer, let's say, in the virtual memory management. We will, if you have time, we will very briefly look at that at the very end of the lecture. But uh, yeah, those virtual memory, uh, virtual machines also have some memory management mechanisms that resemble virtual memory. But right now, I'm talking about really the operating system. Okay. Uh, okay, basically, a small physical memory can appear as a huge one to the programmer, and the life is easier for the programmer, hopefully. And we will see that. So whenever you write programs, you never think about, uh, what is my DRAM size, right? You never manage DRAM, right? You don't think about it. That's, this is the reason, basically. If you were living in the 1950s, you would think about it. <laughs> you would basically try to make sure your code fits in physical memory and data. And if it didn't fit in physical memory, you would program it such that whenever you, it doesn't fit in memory, you would fetch it into a physical memory from somewhere else. Disk, at the time, disk, basically. So life was not easy for those programmers who did not have virtual memory. And it's a mess, basically, to do that. But the downside, of course, is like every idea has a downside and upside. In this case, upside is very huge on the programmer. The downside is more complex system software and architecture, like hardware. And this is actually a very classic example of programmer microarchitecture, microarchitect, or the system designer trade-off that makes programmers' life easy, architects' life hard. And as I said, this requires indirection and mapping between the virtual and physical address spaces. And we're going to talk about all of that indirection mapping that happens. Uh, and we're going to make it faster and faster as much as possible. Okay, makes sense, right? Hopefully. So uh, let's talk about the benefits of automatic management of memory. I mean, we talked about automatic management of caches. This is similar, actually. But caches are transparent to the programmer anyway. Uh, if you, if you, uh, that was what we meant by automatic management, right? Uh, and that was a performance optimization. Here, you, if, you, if your program doesn't fit in physical memory, then you actually have a correctness problem, right? Your program will not run. Uh, but basically, a programmer does not need to deal with physical addresses. Each process, each program that's running on a system has its own virtual address space, which is going to be very large. It could be two to the 64 bytes, for example. And it has an independent mapping of virtual to physical addresses. So each process has this illusion, let's say, of memory being infinite size. And this enables multiple things. Let's take a look at them. But one thing it enables is code and data to be located anywhere in physical memory. Uh, you can relocate uh, some code and data because you have this indirection mechanism that can map the code and data anywhere. Your physical, you don't have physical addresses in your program, so you can, uh, the, the, the location of uh, the program is not dictated by the programmer, basically. The system can locate anywhere because of this flexible indirection. Uh, and this also enables you to isolate or separate code and data of different processes. Now, different processes, uh, they don't use physical addresses. They use virtual addresses. And if they use physical addresses, think about different processes using physical addresses. They have to separate each other somewhat, right? Or you have to have some mechanisms to separate them. And virtual memory provides a mechanism to essentially separate different processes from each other. So one process should not have access potentially to data to, of other process and vice versa. So this is going to be protection and isolation. This is a different uh, benefit of virtual memory, and we're going to talk about that. And then it also enables code and data sharing between multiple processes. Uh, if, if one process wants to share code and data with another process, they can basically map uh, their virtual addresses to the same physical address, as we will see. So this indirection provides a lot of benefits. You can separate uh, physical uh, memory space of different processes, and you can also share physical memory space between processes and you can locate the physical memory of a process anywhere in your physical memory system because those addresses are not hard-coded in the program. Let's put it that way. Okay, so these are three major benefits in the end. Let's take a look at a system with physical memory only. If you look at a physical system, and as I said, if you were living in the 1950s, 60s, uh, you would deal with this, unfortunately. Uh, it's more, uh, basically, there's no indirection. CPU uh, provides physical addresses. Physical addresses are encoded in the program. Uh, and they directly access the physical memory. There's no uh, 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 injection layer, as we will see soon. And this is an example of older systems. Some systems still have that, but many systems have moved on because the benefits to the programmer is huge. But as we will see, the downside will be the complexity. And the complexity is actually amazing. 
This is a very complex system, as we will see. Okay. So basically, uh, let me motivate a little bit more. Physical memory is of limited size uh, because of cost reasons. What if you need more? Uh, the question is, should the programmer be concerned about the size of code and data blocks fitting physical memory? And if they don't fit in physical memory, should they be moving the data from the disk to the physical memory, code and data? It's not files. This is just uh, the code that you're executing in your program. And in the past, actually, there, there's something called overlay programming. People used to try uh, to overlap. So they're executing some code in physical memory. At the same time, they try to figure out what else should come uh, to the physical memory. And they overlay. Uh, this is called overlay programming. So they, they would create overlays such that while you're executing some code, some data, uh, other code is being fetched into physical memory so that you will execute that later on. And you can imagine this, this becomes a mess, basically. As, uh, this is something you don't want to deal with the programmer. Uh, multiple uh, programs may also need the physical memory because we're talking about multiple programs running concurrently, especially concurrent execution of multiple programs become a, becomes a problem. Uh, then the question, this question is actually even harder. Uh, should the programmer make sure all different programs uh, can fit in physical memory? Now, this is something unreasonable to expect from the programmer, right? Programmers programming, uh, you're, you're programming your compiler, they're programming their game, and they're running together. How do you coordinate, right? That doesn't work. So you will need some system support to enable multi-programming. And this is the, one of the major reasons why uh, virtual memory was developed, to have that injection layer such that everybody can play nicely on the same processor, let's say. And uh, this is another thing. Should the programmer ensure two processes do not unintentionally or incorrectly use the same physical memory portion? How do you ensure that? Again, virtual memory is one solution for protection and isolation between processes. And there's another issue that's also interesting to think about. Uh, instruction set architecture can have an address space greater than the physical memory size. Uh, uh, if you look at instruction set architecture specifications, some of them have 64-bit address spaces, right, with wide addressability. Now, if you think about that, that is 16 exabytes, right? But clearly, we don't have 16 exabyte memories today. In a single node, at most, we have is multiple terabytes, let's say. It's increasing, that's the good part, but we're not there yet. So. Uh, virtual memory enables, uh, basically, what if you don't have enough physical memory? You have this huge virtual memory space provided, uh, or, 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 or address space, I shouldn't call virtual memory, maybe address space that's provided in the ISA, and you have, you, you designed a machine that has a tiny memory. It could even be a microcontroller, like executing an ISA, right? So you need some mechanism to manage this physical memory, basically. Okay. So basically, I think uh, I've already said this, but I'll uh, summarize it. There are many difficulties of direct physical addressing. Uh, of physical memory. Programmer needs to manage the physical memory space. This is not good for the programmer, inconvenient and difficult. And it's even more difficult when you're running multiple processes. Uh, difficult to support code and data relocation. Addresses are directly specified in the program. And because of that, uh, it's difficult to uh, change those addresses. It's difficult to support multiple processes, especially concurrently, uh, because you need to provide some protection isolation support for processes that are running together. And if they happen to, these are two different programmers, you wrote a program that's writing to physical address 10. You wrote a program that's writing to physical address 10 also. They should not really write to the same physical address unless they're sharing that physical address. Right? And usually they're not sharing that physical address because these are different programs. Uh, okay, basically, share, how do you share the physical memory space without problems? And it's difficult to support data and code sharing across processes also if you really want to share that address uh, because different processes somehow need to be coordinated to manage uh, reference the same physical address. And how do you do that? So adding a level of injection helps all of these because uh, it enables you to allocate some address and share it with others, for example. Okay, so that's the basic idea of virtual memory. It's written here, we kind of said that already, but give each program the illusion of a large address space while having a small physical memory or smaller physical memory so that the programmer doesn't worry about managing physical memory within a process or across processes. Basically, all of the problems go away with that injection. Now the programmer can assume they have infinite amount of physical memory and the hardware and software cooperatively and automatically manage the physical memory space to provide this illusion. I say hardware and software because you really need some hardware support uh, to enable this and you need even more hardware support to make this faster. And we will see that. System cannot do it like software, system software, operating system cannot do it alone basically. You need some very basic hardware support uh, to uh, enable this indirection in addresses. But if you want to make it faster, you need even more hardware support, as we will see. Okay, so basically, uh, th this illusion of 
infinite address space is maintained for each independent process. I say infinite because it's for all practical purposes infinite, right? Two to the 64. If your virtual memory address space is 64 uh, bits uh, and addressability is eight bytes, it's exa 16 exabytes, as I said, right? Sometimes you may actually get a message saying you ran out of virtual memory. Uh, that how, how, many, how many times did that happen to anyone over here? Did you ever run out of virtual memory? So you can see that it doesn't happen often. It happens to me for some reason. I have maybe too many things running for too long in my machine. <laughs> but you can run out of virtual memory also because it's really, really not infinite in the end. But usually it's because something not good is going on in your system, let's say. <laughs> okay. Uh, basic mechanism is, as I said, indirection and mapping. Uh, indirection enables mapping. Uh, basically, you're, 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 you have indirection and addressing, and you're basically mapping virtual memory addresses to physical memory addresses, two different address spaces. An address generated by each instruction in a program is called a virtual address. Now, it's not the physical address used to access main memory. That's uh, wh where the injection will come in. The schools are called a linear address in x86. x86 actually has very good naming of things, as we will see in their page tables also. Linear address is kind of a weird name, though. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, it has a reason, but we're not going to go into that reason. Uh, and then there's an address translation mechanism that maps this virtual address to a physical address. And this physical address is called real address in x86. This is actually perhaps a nice terminology. And this address translation mechanism can be implemented in hardware and software together. And we will see that, basically. Okay, so conceptual view. This is from the book chapter that we wrote that is assigned to you for all of the, uh, all of the memory lectures. Basically, we want to provide an, the illusion of large separate data space per process. It kind of looks like this, right? Process one has this virtual address space. Process two has the same size virtual address space. They're independent. And uh, you can see that it's 48 bits byte addressable, 256 terabytes each. And your physical memory, physical address space can be only eight gigabytes. What you do is you chunk the virtual address space to what's called pages. This is very similar to we chunk uh, the uh, memory address space to blocks, right? We're going to see the analogy between cache and virtual memory also. But you chunk the address space to what's called pages, in this case, four kilobyte pages, and map four kilobyte portions of the virtual address space to four kilobyte portions of the physical address space, right? So you can see that this virtual page of uh, process one is mapped to this physical page, and this virtual page, the same virtual page, virtual page zero of process two is mapped to another physical page. So both processes can safely reference their own virtual page zeros without interfering with each other because there's an address translation mechanism in between mapping mechanism that maps them to different locations. Right? So that's the basic idea. And as, uh, uh, to be able to do this, you need that indirection and mapping that essentially sits in between the processes and the physical uh, address space. Okay, and that's that indirection and mapping mechanism. Basically, it's called a page table in systems. Uh, address translation is uh, basically CPU generates virtual addresses now. Every virtual address goes through translation. Uh, and the hardware and the software cooperatively, I say hardware over here, but it's actually, it, it, could, it, could, it could be the software also, uh, converts virtual addresses to physical addresses via this translation or lookup table called a page table. That's essentially our translation table. And you look up whether the virtual address is in physical memory. Page table basically tells you, oh, okay, it's in physical memory, this location. And it translates the address to the physical address, and then you can access the location. CPU looks it up. If it's not in the physical address, if the, if the virtual address is not in physical memory, because physical memory is small and you haven't touched that virtual, uh, virtual address in a while, then it must be in disk. And you have another way of figuring out where it is in the disk. And then uh, this mechanism brings the uh, page, physical page, from the disk into the physical memory and then fix up the address, fixes up the address translation such that that virtual address points to a physical memory page. Okay, while you're doing that, of course, you're, if your physical memory is full, you need to kick out something else, right? And if that something else is dirty, meaning modified, then you may need to write it back to disk. Actually, you'd better write it back to disk, right? Otherwise, you will lose the modification that you did inside the memory. So all of this management is done automatically by what is called the demand paging mechanism. So you uh, access uh, a virtual page. It's not in physical memory. You, the page table figures that out. And because you demanded the virtual page, uh, you, pay, you basically bring that page from the disk into the physical memory and fix up the uh, mapping table to reflect that and kick out something else from the physical memory and fix up the mapping table to reflect that also. 
So you see that there's a management operation that's happening here. And we'll see that those operations. OK, does this make sense? So of course, the downside is also clear here, right? Once you look at this, you say, OK, I need to maintain this structure right now. And we'll see that the structure is huge. And then now, it, it used to be, if I had direct access to physical memory, it was just one memory access now, right? But now I have to access the space table. It's huge. Now I have another memory access to actually do my memory access. That another memory access is just for the translation. So you just doubled your memory accesses every time you do a memory access. Doesn't sound good. Yes. Exactly, yes. Yeah, managing the space table requires some, some sort of operating system, basically. Resource manager. <laughs> yes. And we will see the management of the page table. There are a lot of issues that go into the management of the page table. OK. So OK, let's take a look at this again uh, very quickly. I think I already said a lot of things over here, but you have two different processes. Remember that virtual address space is per process. In this case, you can see that it's 4 gigabytes, and physical is 16 megabytes. It depends on the ISA, of course. ISA specifies the virtual address space. This is specified by the ISA. Physical address space is microarchitectural, basically. Uh, it depends on the computer, basically. You may have an x86 processor with a physical address space of uh, virtual address space uh, specified by the ISA uh, of 48 bits, but your physical address space can be uh, 8 gigabytes, right? Uh, I guess that's 33 bits. Uh, okay, so, uh, but it's page based. You chunk uh, the virtual memory, you chunk the physical memory into pages, uh, and these are called virtual pages, these are called physical pages, and then you do some mapping. And then the sharing, if you want to, if two processes want to share the same physical page, then they can point the mapping to the same physical page from different virtual addresses. Right? That's the idea. So, okay, there are many issues over here, at least four issues. Uh, we're going to cover some of them uh, in more detail than others. The first one I'm going to quickly discuss, when to map a virtual address to a physical address. Basically, when do you bring a, a, a page from, uh, from disk to physical memory? And this is usually based on demand. Whenever you access... Uh, reference a virtual address the first time by a program, you bring it into the physical memory and fix up the mapping. Of course, when it's kicked out from physical memory, you bring it again. Okay, what is the mapping granularity? This becomes important. Basically, how, uh, what, what is the si size of the page, the chunks? Is it one byte? Is it a kilobyte? Is it a megabyte? Is it a gigabyte? There are multiple granularities. And this is a problem, right? In fact, uh, we will see that. This is very similar to the block size of caches. Uh, the, the larger granularities are nice because your mapping table becomes smaller, right? Uh, but the larger granularities mean that you're going to bring much larger pages into the uh, physical memory when you fetch them from the disk. It also means that you can store much fewer pages in your physical memory. Meaning if you don't have good locality in that large granularity, both temporal and spatial, you may be wasting a lot of bandwidth as well as physical memory space, right? So it's very similar to cache block size in that sense. OK, but we will see that actually existing systems employ multiple granularities. x86 has 4 kilobyte, 1 megabyte, and 2 gigabyte pages, for example. Uh, but it's not very flexible. OK, when and uh, how to store the virtual physical mappings? Uh, do you do it in operating system data structures? Page table is one. But do you do uh, some, somewhere else also? How do you speed up that translation? Let's say we're going to talk about hardware software cooperative mechanisms. And what do you do when physical address space is full? How do you do the replacement? Which page do you replace? Who's the victim, basically, to replace? Uh, and usually people, uh, like uh, the systems, evict an unlikely to be needed virtual address from the physical memory. The question is, how do you determine that? Especially when your physical memory is very large. Right? OK? So you may have millions and millions of pages in your physical memory. So if, you, if cache management was hard, this, this is even harder potentially as your physical memory sizes get larger and larger. OK. OK, so I think uh, we've covered a lot of this. Some of these slides I will go relatively quickly because they're for your benefit also. Virtual address space is divided into pages. Physical address space is divided into frames. But these are also called pages. So you will see that uh, there are virtual pages and physical pages. I like the term frames, but it's not commonly used. A virtual mapped a page can be mapped to either a physical frame, if the page is in physical memory, or a location in disk, if it's not in physical memory. And if an access virtual page is not in memory, but on disk, virtual memory system brings the page into the physical frame and adjusts the mapping. This is called demand paging. Basically, if you were wondering what demand paging is, this is on demand, you page things inside 
uh, the physical memory. And page table is the page table that stores a mapping of virtual pages to physical frames. So this is one benefit of the page table. Later, we will see protection benefits also. Okay, uh, in other words, if you think about this, physical memory is not a cache for pages stored on disk. You can think of it that way, right? Uh, and this is actually true. Uh, in fact, it's a fully associative cache in modern systems. A virtual page can potentially be mapped to any physical frame, which is interesting. Okay, similar caching issues also exist because of this. And we have covered a lot of caching issues, right? Multiple lectures, where and how to place and find a cache. I will not repeat this, I think. Replacement, granularity of management, uh, write policy. Uh, what do you do about writes, basically? Whenever you write to physical memory, do you also write to disk? Very bad idea. <laughs> Don't do that because physical memory bandwidth is precious. Disk bandwidth is even more precious because it's much lower, right? So normally the right policy is right back, meaning whenever you write to physical memory, you uh, uh, change a bit uh, the modified or dirty bits that we discussed in the cache, uh, saying that I've written to it. Whenever you're replacing, evicting this page, you'd better write it back to disk. Okay. So this right policy is, I think, uh, more clear in this particular case, because there's a huge bandwidth differential and the latency differential between the physical memory and even a very fast SSD today. But that may change actually with other memory technologies that may come in, in between basically. So you may actually rethink some of these right policies going into the future. Okay, so this is the analogs basically. Uh, we, we have this terminology that we developed from caches. They also apply to virtual memory. A block is analogous to page, block size, page size, block offset, page offset. A miss in the cache is similar to a miss in physical memory, which we call a page fault. And we're going to talk about how to handle that. Who handles it? Is it the hardware or the software? Again, cooperatively. Cooperatively is the right answer. But some systems have a lot more hardware built into it, like x86 systems, uh, than some others. Indexing into the cache is done in virtual memory using the virtual page number. And the metadata store, the tag store, is really the page table in virtual memory because it stores the metadata to do the uh, to, to figure out whether actually what you need is in physical memory or not, right? And then the data store is really the physical memory in this particular case. So it's a beautiful analogy. Uh, okay, I think uh, we've kind of defined this. So very quickly, page size, the mapping granularity of virtual physical address spaces. This dictates the amount of data transferred from hard disk to DRAM at once. Of course, because of the earlier slide I showed you, you can, you can now think about, okay, well, maybe I can do sub pages, right? Just like we did sub blocking or sectors in caches. And absolutely, yes. You can. The difference here is this is visible to software. So basically, whenever you do subpages or something like that, page table is visible to the operating system. You need to change the page table somehow so that operating system is also aware of it. And that's, that's why this is difficult to change. In caches, you can easily say some hardware designer can say, okay, I'm going to design the cache completely differently. And they can do it much more easily because they don't need to change anything else in the software stack. Here, the interface to the operating system changes. Okay. Page table is the table that stores virtual to physical page mappings. Uh, and I think uh, we've already discussed this. Uh, and address translation is the process of determining the physical address from the virtual address. Okay, now we're gonna look at some examples uh, of this. Basically what we're trying to do, uh, let's take a look at the analogy again. Uh, in the caches, in the memory hierarchy, we call that we want the speed of the small memory at the capacity of the large memory. So we build a cache hierarchy. And if you look at this picture, virtual to physical mapping, we want the speed of this uh, physical memory because it's faster while getting the capacity of the virtual memory, including the hard drive, of course. So it's a very similar uh, thing that we're doing. So the hope is that most accesses, ideally all accesses, are in physical memory, hit in physical memory, and programs see the capacity of the large virtual memory. Right? And if, you're, uh, if you have good locality and if you're managing the virtual memory system, meaning the physical memory space nicely, maybe you can make it happen. But the same similar trade-offs to caching also exist. That's why we cover virtual memory after caching actually, because you know uh, the caching concepts much uh, better right now, clearly. Okay, so let's talk about uh, this translation. So clearly uh, we need to do some address translation. How does that work? Oh, this is from your book. Uh, you can see the chapter over here, but basically you have a, in this particular case, 31-bit virtual address. Page size is four kilobytes, this is byte addressable. So you have a page offset as 12 bits to decide the page, uh, basically bytes in the page. That doesn't get translated. What gets translated is the virtual page number and that gets translated to a physical page number because the page size is equal in the virtual memory and the physical memory. 
It has to be for your translation to work nicely, let's say, or at least not be complex. So basically, you translate this virtual page number from the virtual address to a physical frame number or physical page number. Uh, and this translation is done through the page table. And you basically concatenate the page offset to it. So it's very simple, as you can see. So let's take a look at an example from your book again. Uh, the uh, uh, virtual memory size 2 to the 31 bytes. Physical memory size is 2 to the 27 bytes, 2 gigabytes, 128 megabytes. These are very small by today's standards. Uh, page sizes 2 to the 12 bytes. This is similar to what you have in, as small pages in today's systems, many systems. And the organization basically looks like this. Virtual address 31 bits, physical address 27 bits, page offset is 12 bits, which means that the number of virtual pages you have is 2 to the 19, the number of physical pages you have is 2 to the 15. So it can basically determine your virtual page number and physical page number easily. Okay, and this is one mapping that your uh, book shows. On the right side, you have the virtual page number uh, and where it gets mapped to physical, uh, in physical memory. And you can see that the blue uh, colored virtual pages are mapped inside the physical memory. The white colored ones are on the disk. And that's just an example. And you can think of this as your page table also. Basically, the page table uh, is indexed by the virtual page number, and it gives you which, what is the physical page number associated with that virtual page number if it's mapped in physical memory. OK, so basically, how do you translate the addresses through a page table? Page table has entry for each virtual page. That's why this is huge. If, you're, uh, if your uh, address space, uh, well, we will see the size in a little bit. Each page table entry has a valid bit. This valid bit says whether the virtual page is located in the physical memory. Basically, it's, uh, you can translate and you can access physical memory. Otherwise, it must be fetched from the hard disk. If the valid bit is zero, you get a page fault and you need to fetch it from the hard disk. And then the page table entry has also a physical page number. where This basically tells you where the virtual page is located in physical memory, obviously. And it also has other stuff like we did in caches, right? Replacement policy bits, modified 30 bits, permission bits, and access bits. We will see that. Okay, so this is the page table from your book again. This is a very simple page table that just shows a valid bit and physical page number. It doesn't have the modified bit, for example, but that's okay. That's just for translation purposes at this point. So you need to have an entry for each virtual page. Uh, so the size of the page table is uh, uh, the number of virtual pages time the, times the page table entry size, basically, and we will see that. Uh, and you can see that some, uh, pay, uh, some, some bits are valid over here. For example, this page table entry has uh, a, a corresponding translation. Uh, it's valid, this, meaning that this virtual page is, uh, page is in physical memory, and the physical memory page number is this. So how do you do the translation? Basically, you need to index the page table using the virtual page number so that you can get the right entry, uh, page table entry, uh, for that virtual page number. Uh, to be able to do that indexing, the page table needs to be in physical memory. We're going to question that later. Assume that right now. Page table is located at the physical memory address specified by a special register. It's called the page table base register. This is per process. Every process has to have that. And this has to be uh, known inside the hardware, basically, so that you can do this translation. And you index with the virtual page number, meaning you take this base address. You add to it virtual page number times the page table entry size because each entry is fixed size. Do a memory access to that location. That location has your page table entry. In this particular case, virtual page number is two. So basically, uh, it, uh, the, that addressing brings you to this location. And you get that page table entry through a memory access. This is, we're assuming this is in physical memory. And basically, this says, oh, uh, it's valid, meaning the, uh, the physical page is in uh, physical memory. And its address is this. So how do you do the translation? You take that physical page number and append to it the page offset coming from the virtual address. And this is your physical address, basically. Makes sense, right? This, your book also has multiple examples. But uh, the interesting thing here is how you index the page table, right? It's simple, basically. Indexing is simple, but you need to do a memory access to get the page table entry. OK, so the page table provides the page, uh, physical page number. And page offset bits do not change during translation, so it's a simple concatenation of bits. And then, so this is just the address. You form the physical address, and then you access memory again with that physical address to get the data that you need. Okay, so let's take a look at an example. What is the physical address of virtual address 5F20? Uh, you first need to find the page table entry contain the translation for the corresponding VPN. Basically, you need to figure out what's the VPN here. 
since uh, the, uh, it's four kilobyte pages, 12 bits are chopped off. So VPN is five, basically, virtual page number. And you, we need to look up the page table entry at that address. So how do you do that? Uh, we have the page table base register, which is a physical address. Add to it VPN, which is five times the PTE size. PTE size can be four bytes. In x86, we will see that it's eight bytes. It's increasing. Uh, so that's your physical address. So you access memory at that physical address. In this particular case, uh, VPN is five, as I said. Entry five in page table indicates VPN five is, five is here. And it indicates that it's valid and in physical page one. So your physical address is, oh, this is getting in the way. So your physical address is physical page number one concatenated to it offset F20. Okay, and then you access memory with that physical address. Does that sound good? Okay. Okay, now let's take a look at another example that will not be as nice. Uh, now we are looking at virtual page number seven. Entry seven in the page table indicates a valid bit is zero, meaning it's not in physical memory, so all of this is useless, let's say. Uh, so virtual page must be swapped into physical memory from disk, and there needs to be another mechanism. So at this point, you get an exception, for example, and that exception needs to be handled by the software if you're handling these page table uh, the page fault in software. You may be handling some, of, some part of it or all of it in hardware also. Okay, and we'll see that trade off hopefully later on. Does that make sense? Now, uh, it, there's a lot of work. You're trying to access physical memory, but what you're trying to access is not in physical memory. So you need to wait for a long time. That's why when you get a page fault, it takes a long time to, uh, uh, to, uh, for the process uh, to continue. Okay, let's take a look at a bunch of issues over here. One of the issues is actually page table size. I kind of uh, asked you to assume that the page table is in physical memory, but that's a very unreasonable assumption. And let's see why it's very unreasonable. Now, let's assume that our physical uh, virtual uh, address space is 64 bits and page size is 12 bits, uh, four, four kilobytes, sorry, but page offset is 12 bits, basically. Uh, basically, you need to have a mechanism to translate 52 bits into 28 bits, right? I, I'm assuming a 40-bit physical address, which is not unreasonable, right? That's one terabyte, not bad. Uh, so basically, your page table needs to be needs to translate a 52-bit virtual page number to a 28-bit physical page number. It sounds good if you just look at this box, but this is the number of bytes you need in your page table to be able to do that, right? You basically have to have one entry for every virtual page number. That's two to the 52. Assuming each entry is a modest four bytes, you need two to the 54 bytes. How many of you have two to the 54 byte memory? In your pocket, right? <laughs> no, not even SSDs have that size, right? I mean, two to the 54 is, what is that? Is that a 16 petabytes? I think so, yeah, 16 petabytes. Yeah, and that's not, this, this is not it, right? This is if you're running one process. If you have 100 processes, they all need to have page tables, right? Multiply this by the number of processes that you're supporting. Good luck. And uh, this is actually uh, important. The process may not be using the entire virtual memory space, actually. So how many of you write programs that use uh, two of the 64 bytes in the virtual memory space? Not many, probably, right? That's, that's 16 exabytes, as we discussed, right? Most of the time, you don't write programs that are that big, meaning that this virtual address is provisioned to give you the infinite illusion, but to support it, we need something much more reasonable than just this huge monolithic page table. That's the idea. Because monolithic page table, if you have a monolithic page table, not only its physical memory size is large, assume that somehow you fit it in physical memory, magic, but you're wasting a lot of it, right? Most of the valid bits over there is going to be in zero. Why? Because your program is not going to need them even at any point in time, because you're not going to use your virtual memory address space. Okay. So basically, that's the first challenge. Page table is large. At least part of it needs to be located in physical memory. Uh, okay. I gave you the solution, I guess. <laughs> basically, not all of it needs to be located in physical memory, uh, but some of it needs to be uh, located in physical memory so that you can find the other portion that are not located in physical memory by doing the translation through that part that is located in physical memory. And that brings us to multi-level hierarchical page tables. Uh, okay, basically we want to organize the page table in a hierarchical manner, such that only a small first level page table has to be in physical memory. And this is the idea, multi-level hierarchical page tables. It's also called radix trees in the way we will discuss. 
But it looks like this. This is again from your book. You divide the virtual page number into two pieces, and then you use one piece, line nine bits over here, to index a first level page table. And this basically contains the address of the real page table you're looking for. That's another level of injection right now, right? And uh, basically, this is nine bits, you index, it gives you the address of the page table you're looking for, which may not be in physical memory, which may be in disk. And the virtual memory system kicks in, brings the page table into physical memory, and then fills this address. And that address points to the base of that page table that you're looking for. And you take that base register, add to it the page table offset, meaning the second 10 bits in the virtual page number, and get your translation from the second level page table. Does that make sense? So now only this page, first level page table has to be in physical memory. And this can be small. As you can see, it's two to the nine, entry, two to the nine entries. If each of them is four bytes, it's two kilobytes. I can live with that. Right. But now, if uh, none of this has to be in physical memory, because you're using the virtual memory system to store the page tables also. Right. So it's kind of interesting, right? You're, you have this virtual memory system that's built on page tables, but you're actually figuring out where the page tables are using this virtual memory system that's built on page tables. So page tables are subject to translation as well, as long as only one page table is in physical memory. Makes sense, right? Okay. Then, of course, the question is who brings this page table into physical memory? That's the job of the operating system, basically, at some point, but we will not talk about that. Uh, but we solved the problem. And this problem, this solution actually buys you multiple things. Uh, only a very small part of the page table, it has to be in physical memory. And only the second level page tables that are needed uh, can be kept in physical memory. Meaning, if the program doesn't require, if the program requires only one, page table over here, you don't need to have anything else. Meaning you got rid of the huge page table uh, and that doesn't even come into uh, the uh, physical memory at all. Does that make sense? So only, that, only the translations that you have accessed, uh, okay, I should say it more carefully. Only the page tables that house the translations that you need have to be brought into the physical memory. Okay? Plus, though, of course, the first level page table. Okay. So that's the good part. So now let's take a look at the translation. Of course, it's hopefully simple right now. This is our virtual address now. It's 19 bits again. Uh, the, the top nine bits are zero. So you basically index into the first level page table using the PTBR of the first level page table. Add to the index, get the page table entry. In this case, you're lucky. The page table happens to be in physical memory. That's good that you're looking for. And the base address of the second level page table is this physical memory address. And you use that index into it using the second 10 bits in the virtual page number, which takes us over here according to your book. I'm going to take your book's word, the blue part. And that also happens to be valid, meaning that's uh, uh, the, the, the physical page you're looking for is also in physical memory. The uh, virtual page you're looking for is also in physical memory. And that is the uh, virtual uh, physical page number. So you take that physical page number, concatenate with it the page offset, and that's your physical address that you want to access. And then you do the memory access to that location. So now to be able to do one memory access uh, to this physical memory, I have to do one memory access to get this base table, base address of my page, second level page table, and then another memory access to get my page table entry that is needed for the translation. So now one memory access that we want to do became three memory accesses, right? Doesn't sound very good, <laughs> but we solved the problem of the size of the page table. Okay, so basically you could keep doing this. For an N level page table, we need N page table accesses to find the PTE. So uh, if I uh, ask you the question over here, this is a very small address, right? This is 31 bits. What happens if it's 64 bits? Well, you're back to kind of square one uh, because uh, your page tables again become very big, so people have added multi level. In, in x86, for example, you have five levels of page tables, and that's five memory accesses to get your translation. That's a lot. Okay, so this is x86, basically. You can see uh, in this particular case, uh, you, this, is, this is the first level page table. They call it page directory, which is nice actually. Uh, CR3 is basically the physical address, as you can see over here. That's the page table base register in x86 terminology. 
And you basically do what we just discussed, index into the first level page table, get the base address of the second level page table, index into it using these portions of the uh, virtual address, get the translation, and then do the translation, assuming you're hit in memory, of, uh, in physical memory, of course, right? And you can see that there's four kilobyte pages and the normal 32-bit physical address size. This is small. Okay, this is small pages. Let's take a look at that. So we just uh, showed this, but uh, this added just the numbers over here. You can see that this is 10 bits. Uh, this is also 10 bits, and this is 12 bits. Uh, okay, then CR3 needs to be, again, physical, as we see. Let's take a look at large pages. So this is the benefit of large pages. With large pages, you don't need to do multi-level. In this case, large pages are four megabytes, as you can see, with a 32-bit address. Your first level page table uh, can be uh, essentially uh, only two to the 10 entries because your page offset is huge, right? It's four megabytes. And this is the reason why they picked four megabytes <laughs> so that they don't change that. They keep the first level page table size at four kilobytes. So if you ever wonder why people pick the num these numbers, this is actually a very reasonable way of picking the number. Okay, now this is four-level paging. This is not the most, uh, let's say, sophisticated one. Uh, so you can see that this is the original page table. This is the, what does the translation. This is the, okay, this is the first level. Uh, you get the base address of the second, second level page table. They call page directory pointer. And then that gives you the base address of the third level page directory. And that gives you the base address of the final page table, which will give you the translation. So you can see that this, this is called a page table walk. If you want to go, if you need to go through uh, all of these page tables, you're really walking the page tables. And this is, if you think about it, you're getting the pointers to the page tables, right? At every step. It's really a dependent accesses. And in this case, you need one, two, three, four accesses to the translation and one more access to access the memory. Okay. Okay. So we solved, but, but we did solve the page tables large problem. Okay, maybe we should take a break right now. <laughs> yes, before the break. Like this one? This is, no, no, this is in the manual, in the ISA manual. Yeah, if you pay, 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 search for the x86 ISA manual, it's in one of the 48,036 pages. <laughs> 4,836, sorry, 48,000 is too much. <laughs> but yes, this, is, this has to be specified, why? because the operating system that's built on it also needs to know this. Yeah, operating system can do exactly the same thing on its own and populate the page tables, et cetera. So all of the specification is very interesting. I think it has 100 pages of, maybe more than 100 pages, probably, probably two, 300 pages of virtual memory specification. Maybe even more, don't quote me on it. Somebody can look it up. Okay, let's take a 10 minute break at this point, and then we're gonna cover even more interesting issues in virtual memory. And hopefully we will finish this lecture, we'll see. <laughs> Yes. Uh, two questions. First, I, I see how having so first and second level page uh, tables solves the problem of not having everything in physical in physical memory. Yes. You still mm -hmm. need, I mean, you told us that it would have to be like exabytes uh, mm -hmm. in size, but you, can, you can't store this on the disk either, right? Yeah, but uh, some of them are not stored basically.
Okay, let's get started. So uh, one of your fellow students came and asked the question, is this in specialized hardware? Everything you see here is in physical memory. Well, not everything, but basically uh, these, uh, the, the way you access these, this is not special hardware. Just like you would access memory with loads and stores, you access the page tables with loads and stores also. But later we will talk about specialized hardware to accelerate this process. So far, I'm assuming you're doing a load and store memory access to get the first level page table entry, another load, well, I shouldn't say store, a load to get this first entry, another load to get this next entry, another load to get this next entry, another load to get the translation, and then another load to do the, uh, to get your data that you're really looking for. So five loads to get the data that you really want. So we've substituted one load with five loads. That doesn't sound very good, right? But we're doing it in our systems, right? So clearly we don't, we're not always doing it with five loads. So let's see uh, what we do to accelerate the process. And that's the second challenge basically. Essentially each memory access, I should say, it could be an instruction fetch or a data fetch load store requires at least two memory accesses now, right? One of them is for the address translation. And if you're lucky, you get the address translation with one access, but as you can see, that's not possible with the, uh, with the page table sizes we have. So it could be five accesses, uh, four accesses. Actually, uh, we, there's a five level also in x86 that we didn't look at. So it could be five accesses. And then you, can, you need to do one access, uh, one memory access to access the data with the physical address that you get after the translation. Okay. So even two is not good, basically. Two or more memory access to service and instruction fetch or load store greatly degrades the execution time of a program, right? That doesn't sound good. And also, as we discussed, number of memory accesses or page table accesses increases with multi-level page tables, unless we're cl clever, basically. So clearly no one is doing this, uh, at least not all the time. So we want to speed up the translation. That's where the hardware comes in, basically. So we're gonna introduce a cache of translations. So how do you speed up the translation? Do more caching. So we're gonna cache the translations, basically, and that's the idea of translation look aside buffer. This could easily be called a translation cache. A better, a more, uh, let's say, uh, precise way of thinking about it is a page table entry cache. Basically, cache of page table entries. And that's the idea, basically. Cache the page table entries in a small, fast hardware structure in the processor to speed up the address translation. And that's the idea of a TLB you may have heard of. How many people heard of TLBs? Okay, you haven't heard of, that's good. Uh, you're learning a lot in this last lecture. Uh, there's a lot more to learn across the entire life, so don't worry. <laughs> uh, uh, this is essentially a small cache of most recently used page table entries. In other words, most recently used virtual to physical translations. And clearly, it reduces, if you hit in the TLB, it reduces the number of memory access required for instruction fetches and load stores to only one TLB access. Now we don't go to memory. This is a very fast structure in hardware. It just gives you the translation right away. Now that's beautiful, right? And we use a concept that we know of caching. We know how to optimize caches. And everything that we did for caches applies to translation look aside buffers. Now, it's interesting. You have this memory hierarchy to service our loads and stores. And now we have a memory hierarchy for the translation. Right? And we will see that this is really becoming a memory hierarchy. And they interact because translation, translations are really part of your memory hierarchy. But now we have specialized caches for those translations because translation is needed so that you can access the data, right? Okay, so why does this work? Clearly, uh, page table access have temporal and spatial locality, unless you're doing completely random access. And again, same things apply that we discussed for caches. Memory access have temporal and spatial locality. So your page table access also have temporal and spatial locality. And if you have large page sizes, you better exploit spatial locality. Uh, gigabytes of page size, for example, exploit spatial locality nicely, assuming you have that sort of spatial locality in your uh, program. And clearly the intuition is that consecutive instructions and loads and stores are likely to access the same page, right? Because imagine you're uh, streaming through an array. If you're streaming through an array, and if your array is, let's say, one gigabyte, and if all of them is mapped to one physical page, every translation is the same, is go going through the same page table entry. So that's why TLB works. Okay, uh, okay. essentially we've, we've kind of said this. Usually TLBs are small and it could be multi-levels as we will see. 
uh, typical entries are 16 to 512, usually high associativity. And you get, typically, you get good hit rates. Uh, but of course, this depends on the workload. As I said, if you're truly random access, this is 0% hit rate, and you're back to square one. And this reduces the number of memory access for most instruction fetches to only one TLB access, hopefully. That's the hope. And that's the idea of a memory hierarchy, right? Now this is a translation hierarchy, if you will. This is an example of two entry TLB from your book. There's nothing really special about it. It's just two entries, kind of boring, right? It's a two entry cache of translations. And you can see that this is the translations. Uh, you have the virtual page number, physical page number, and the valid bit. Uh, and basically, uh, the, the tag is your virtual page number in this particular case in this cache, as you can see, because it's fully associated, right? You search all possible positions for the virtual page number you're looking for a translation for. And in this particular case, this virtual page number is two. It matches this entry. As a result, you know this is the physical page number, and you take this physical page number and concatenate it with your page offset, and that's your physical address. Now you can use this physical address to access your cache, right? Data cache or instruction cache, depending on what that virtual where that virtual address is coming from. Make sense? Okay, good. So basically, as I said, all issues we discussed in caching and prefetching lectures apply to TLBs. We have separate instruction and data TLBs today because they're accessing different parts of the pipeline, as you know. We have multi-level TLBs, associativity, all of the insertion, promotion, replacement policies, what to keep in the TLB, and which TLB, and how to decide that. Prefetching also applies in TLBs. Modern systems have prefetching into the TLBs because you may prefetch the translations, right? Uh, and intelligent prefetches actually prefetch translations today. Uh, Coherence potentially applies to TLBs because two different processes may have uh, cached the same translation in their TLBs. If one of them updates the translation, the other probably should update the translation also. Uh, this is the job of the operating system again. Operating system actually, if it changes the translation uh, in a page table because it brings a page uh, from, uh, uh, from the disk to the physical memory and kicks out a page uh, that has a translation in the TLB, it basically has to go through all of the TLBs and get, get rid of the translation. Otherwise, what happens is you will get a wrong data, right? Because some, uh, your, the, the, the page, uh, the virtual page is not mapped anymore in physical memory, but you have the translation, the TLB. You need to keep the TLBs coherent with the page table modification that the operating system does. Now you see the complexity, right? This, this sort of coherence is called a TLB shoot down, actually, sometimes in uh, operating system terminology. You basically need to go and shoot down all of the translations that you have cached in your TLBs. It's a mess, as you can see, right? <laughs> now you see these complexities. There's, there's going to be more. Uh, do you have shared versus private TLBs across boards and threads? Dot, dot, dot. You can fill in the rest. OK, now let's take a look at some examples. I'm going to go through some of these quickly because we've kind of talked about a lot of this. But virtual memory, as you can see, requires both hardware and software support. Page tables in memory. It can be cached in special hardware structures. The hardware component is usually called the MMU, or memory management unit. It's a very general name, unfortunately. Uh, it includes the page table base registers, TLBs, and page walkers. We didn't talk about page walkers, but page walkers are specialized hardware structures that do the page table walk that we discussed. You load the first level page table entry, and then based on that, you go and load the second level page table entry. There's specialized hardware that can accelerate it, especially in x86 processors, for example. There's essentially a page management, I think page management handling or PMH unit, for example, uh, that does this page walk, for example. And it's the job of the software, in other words, especially the operating system, to populate the page tables, decide what to replace in physical memory, and change the page table base register on a context switch to use the running threads page table. Right? Because every process has its own page table, so you need to change the page table to the correct uh, page table base register so that you can access things correctly. Otherwise, this becomes a security problem. right? If one process accesses some other process data, because the operating system forgot to change the page table base register, that doesn't sound very good. OK, so this, this part of the virtual memory actually provides that sort of isolation. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. And also, operating system needs to handle page faults and ensure correct mapping, of course, right? OK, so I think we talked about address translation. Page size is specified by the ISA, like the page table structure also. And in the old times, page sizes were small. And over time, page size grew. Uh, and small and large pages are mixed together today. 
And remember the cache lectures, that's essentially the trade-offs. We covered it in an earlier slide, so I'm not going to talk about that again. A uh, page table contains an entry for each virtual page, and this is called a PTE, as we discussed. What's in a PTE? Let's talk about that a little bit. And we, we, saw, the, we saw the valid bit and the page, uh, physical page number, uh, and the dirty bit, as I mentioned. But you can think of page table as a tag store for the physical memory data store. Uh, and there's a tag store entry. Need a valid bit, as we discussed. This indicates the presence or validity in physical memory. Need tag bits, physical page number, physical frame number. Need bits to support replacement. We're going to talk about that soon. Need a dirty bit to support write back caching. Need protection bits to enable access control and protection. So this is my cartoonish picture from some number of years ago. It didn't change because virtual memory did. Remember, virtual memory did not change for a long time. OK, so I'll, these slides are mainly for your benefit. Just uh, you can look at it. But we've already covered the address translation part. And we've already said everything here, actually. If you're interested, you can look at it. But let's take a look at uh, this from an MM, MMU perspective, let's say. Page it. Clearly, we discussed that. Cross-search sends a virtual address. Uh, memory management unit, you can think of this as including the page table base register, TLBs, uh, and walking of the page table. Memory management unit fetches the page table entry from the page table in memory or from the TLB and basically translates the address, gives the physical address, uh, uh, and the physical address is used to access the cache and memory after it. And then you get the data. Okay, this is a page hit. Well, what happened on a page fault? We did not discuss that, so let's discuss that a little bit. So again, MMU in this particular case checks the TLB. TLB may say there's a page fault if you're lucky, but usually to get to a page fault, uh, you need to access the page table, walk the page table, and at some point uh, you figure out that uh, the page is not in physical memory. Even the page table may not be in physical memory. So you may actually get many, many page faults to get the data you're looking for, right? Because remember, you're doing five translations, or four, let's say. Uh, only one of them is going to be in your physical memory. That's when, you, when your process gets switched in, the page table base register gets into physical memory. Uh, the, the, the first level page table gets into physical memory. The first time you're accessing something cold, let's say, you've never accessed it before, you need to have page faults in all of the translations plus the data you're looking for. So that's a lot of page faults, basically. And what is a page fault? Basically, uh, the MMU triggers a page fault exception. Uh, and this could be handled in software or hardware. We will see that. If it's handled in software, the operating system kicks in, and uh, that exception handler identifies a victim page. If it's dirty, evicts it out to the disk and pages in the new page and updates the page table entry in memory. But it also needs to update the, update the kicked out pages page table entry. Uh, that's where the TLB shutdown, et cetera, uh, comes in. And there are other issues that we did not discuss, right? So you're evicting something from your physical memory. How you do that matters. If, if all you have is a physical page number and you're evicting based on the physical page number, now you have a problem because you need to fix the translation from virtual page number to physical page number. You said, I'm, I'm going to evict this physical page. But you don't know what the virtual page number for that physical page is. Right? Meaning, you need to have a reverse mapping table also, potentially. Physical, this is called an inverted page table, sometimes in operating systems. So to be able to do the replacement, you may need to have map the physical page, num uh, page number to the virtual page number. That your page table is not going to help you in that one, sorry, right? Unless you do an associative search across your entire page table. So you see, hopefully, the complexity in this, right? So some operating systems have uh, inverted page tables, or they become clever. They actually use some other sort of indexing into the page table, which we're not going to uh, go into here. OK. OK, so this, even though this is just five lines, this may actually takes, uh, take uh, many, 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 many microseconds or milliseconds, uh, because you're doing a disk access also. And eventually, the exception handler returns to the original process and restarts the faulty instruction. So if this is handled in software, software does all of this. If this is handled in hardware, hardware does all of this. But there needs to be coordination between the software and hardware in terms of the modification of the page tables. They both need to see the same state, because the operating system uh, sometimes manages uh, the page table also, even though hardware manages it to accelerate it. OK, so basically, let's talk about this page fault a little bit. Page fault means that uh, you have a miss in physical memory. Uh, page table entry indicates that virtual page is not in memory, basically. Access to such a page triggers a page fault exception. Now we're talking about an OS handling this. And the OS exception handler is invoked to move data from disk into memory. Other processes can continue executing, but this process basically is moved aside, and OS uh, basically handles this page fault. 
and it has full control over page placement. And before fault, basically, uh, you, you, you don't have the mapping that you need on the physical memory. And after fault, you basically have a mapping for the page. This page is what you're looking, what you're looking for, basically. OK, let's take a look at this from the system perspective, where the operating system handles it. So processor signals uh, the I.O. controller to handle it, initiates a, a discrete, again, through the control of the operating system. Uh, you basically read a block of length P, page size, at disk address X and store the starting, uh, uh, store the page starting at memory address Y. And the operating system needs to know uh, P, of course, that's specified by the ISA, but also where is the page that I'm looking for and where should I put it, All right? These are decisions that you need to make. So where is the page I'm looking for it needs to be stored somewhere. It could potentially be stored in the page table. Uh, in, whenever you don't have a valid bit, you may actually store some stuff that indicates where it is in the disk potentially, but you may not have enough space over there. So you may actually store it somewhere else also. Uh, and then disk basically provides uh, the read through a direct memory access. There is usually in memory controls and IO controls a direct memory access path. You go from the disk IO controller and the memory controller and transfer the page into the memory directly under the control of this basically. Uh, and eventually that page gets com uh, transfer completed and the controller signals completion to the processor saying that I'm done servicing this page fault and the operating system says okay the mapping is also changed that they change the uh, mapping and then the operating system uh, resumes the suspended process so this takes a lot of time basically okay any questions basically you don't want to get page faults let's put it that way <laughs> okay page replacement algorithm if physical memory is full which physical frame do you replace on a page fault it's very similar to uh, cache replacement algorithms, except physical memory size is huge. Right? Basically, even in caches, 2LRU was not feasible. Here, it's not going, it's going to be even less feasible. Right? You can do this exercise on your own. Four gigabyte memory, four kilobyte pages. Uh, that's basically four gigabyte divided by four kilobyte factorial possibilities of ordering, and not good. Uh, so clearly, even caches use approximations of LRU, but physical memory also does. There's a clock algorithm, which we will briefly talk about. But you can use many other algorithms. More sophisticated algorithms actually incorporate both recency of use and frequency of use. And this is a dated algorithm, this ARC algorithm, but it's actually a nice algorithm developed by IBM. And it's used, uh, some, some kind of versions of it are used in operating systems, basically. This is actually a good, uh, uh, there, there are actually a lot of algorithms that people have developed that we will not talk about. But clock is a very simple algorithm that was developed early on. Uh, Basically, uh, there's a bit in each TLB or page table entry that says whether the page is referenced recently. This is called a reference bit, uh, access bit. And basically, you store these bits somewhere. It could be a bit vector data structure that's actually uh, in the operating system, potentially cached in hardware. But uh, you have these bits for every single page that's in your physical memory. And you basically uh, have a clock, let's say, clock as a hand, right? And this hand points to the next page that you would like to replace. You are going to replace the page uh, that has this bit reset, meaning not recently accessed. Right? So this algorithm, what it does is it examines each entry that the hand is pointing to. If the entry is zero, that's the page to replace. If the entry is not zero, meaning one, it, go, it basically sets the bit to zero and goes to the next entry. And basically it keeps searching for an entry with zero that's not recently accessed. And while at the same time, setting the resetting the bits to zero so that I visited this entry, meaning it's not going to be recently used anymore from my perspective, right? Okay, that's the idea. Basically, the way it's done, in, uh, uh, it's done is you have a circular list of physical frames in memory, operating system has this. You keep a pointer hand to the last examined frame in the list. When a page is accessed, you set the R bit or reference bit in the PTE. In x86, it's called the A bit, access bit, basically. It's the same thing. Whether or not you recently accessed this uh, page, and when a frame needs to be replaced, you replace the first frame that has the reference bit not set, as I discussed, and you traverse the circular list from the pointer, meaning hand clockwise. That's why it's called clock basic. You can imagine these bits uh, looking like a clock like this. People were creative, as you can see. And during traversal, you clear the arbits of the examined frame so that eventually you get to, eventually in the worst case, you traverse all of the physical, all of these bits, and you get to the bit that you reset. Right, and then you evict that. Kind of stupid, but <laughs> it happens, right? I mean, it's not stupid from the respect. This, this counts on the fact that there are, some, uh, there are some bits that are not set, right? 
You see? So the replacement time may be long. That's why people have implored this, basically. This is old stuff, but it's kind of a cute idea, as you can see. Okay, and then you set the end pointer to the next frame in the list. Is that clear? Okay. Uh, modern operating systems actually have a much more improved word. If they improve, if they, if they employ something based on clock, it's much more improved. Basically, they don't run into that very bad case where they have to traverse all of the physical memory bits uh, to actually get to it, uh, get to a zero. Okay, so I think we've discussed this. Uh, physical memory is a cache for disk. It's managed by the system software mostly, accelerated by hardware via the virtual memory subsystem. And page replacement is similar to cache replacement. And we've already said this. The difference is required speed of access to the cache versus physical memory is very different. So a physical memory is actually much slower than a L1 cache, for example, or even an L2 cache, even an L3 cache. So replacement algorithms can be more sophisticated, let's say, and they can look at more data. Number of blocks in a cache versus physical memory is also different, even though caches are becoming bigger. Actually, today caches are becoming very big, but still your physical memories are big. Uh, as a result, the number of blocks you have, number of pages you have in physical memory is greater than the number of blocks that you have, even the largest caches today. But as you know, we keep building larger and larger caches and cache block size doesn't change that much. Whereas page sizes are actually increasing potentially. Okay, and the tolerable amount of time to find a replacement candidate actually uh, changes because of that. In cache replacement, you have to make the decision quickly. In page replacement, you don't have to be extremely quick. That's why clock algorithm was tolerable initially. Right now, actually, it's not as tolerable, let's say, but still there's more latency uh, in the memory access that you can tolerate. And again, role of hardware versus software. We said caches are managed by hardware. You could also help get help with software, but here you need some software management because uh, it's really the operating system that has to eventually bring data from the SSD, for example, and fix the mapping tables. You can imagine hardware doing that completely, but it's, it's very, very costly in the end. Okay, now memory protection. So this is another aspect of virtual memory. So virtual memory has two functions. One is providing the illusion of infinite memory, and the other orthogonal function is protecting memory. These are two orthogonal things, actually. Address translation we discussed so far, right? That's the illusion of infinite memory. Protection is completely different. Today, we do both of them at the same time. But there's no reason to do that, frankly. I think going forward, we may need to rethink how we have these functions. So what is memory protection? Uh, this is an area that I really like. Uh, and you will see why. <laughs> so basically, you have multiple programs that are running concurrently, right? Processes. Each process is on page table. And each process can use its virtual address space without worrying about where the other programs are. Whenever you write a program, you don't care where the other programs are. You don't even know whether, whether there are other programs that are going to run with your program, right? Because of thanks to virtual memory. Right? So a process can only access physical, page, uh, physical pages mapped to its own page table. It cannot overwrite memory of another process space. That's the idea. Unless they're explicitly sharing uh, some physical memory. And this... This fact provides protection and isolation between processes. The page tables are separate across processes, and unless they're sharing data explicitly, which means that somebody manages the mapping such that two different virtual addresses from two different processes map to the same physical page, and that is done usually through operating system control today, uh, their, their, their address spaces are completely separate. So this also enables access control mechanisms per page. So there are two issues. One is protection and isolation across different processes, and then per page access control mechanisms. Even within a process, you may not want to give access control to some of the pages. For example, uh, you may not want to, uh, uh, want to give rights uh, permissions to a file that you opened uh, to just read, right? That page should not be uh, written uh, to. So why do I call about, talk about files? So files are actually usually memory mapped today. Uh, when we open a file on disk, it also has this memory mapping table. Basically, you map the files in terms of pages into the memory. So uh, four, a four kilobyte portion of the file gets mapped to physical memory, and then you have a page table entry pointing to it. That's how you update a file in physical memory. And then you write it back to the disk, for example. So you may have opened the file uh, with a write permission, and you, uh, uh, you should not be able to, uh, well, without a write permission, you should not be able to write to it. Uh, another example is executable code, for example. Uh, can you uh, executable pages? So if you have a data page where code doesn't reside, 
you should not have execute permissions to it, for example. This was introduced more recently in the grand scheme of things more recently in the late, in the 1990s, actually, I believe. Uh, but uh, the idea is if someone somehow sneaks in something to your data page, uh, they should not be able to execute that stuff, right? That's the idea. Uh, okay, so basically there are protection mechanisms that you have uh, inside per page. So let's take a look at it. I think we've already discussed this. Uh, you can see that virtual address space for process one over here is separate from virtual address space for process two. And you can see that uh, they can share uh, some pages also. For example, the library code. If they're executing uh, a common library, uh, they, they can share that library, as you can see in the same physical page. And again, this is done under the operating system control. But this page, this page two uh, that belongs to this process in this picture should not be accessible at all uh, by this process over here. Hopefully that makes sense. Let's take a look at how this is done. So this is called page level access control or protection. Not every process is allowed to access every page. And at the very basic level, uh, to access system level pages, you need supervisor or kernel level privilege. Supervisor is the old name for kernel. And you may not be able to execute instructions on some pages. And the idea is to store access control information on a page basis in the processes page table. And enforce the access control at the same time as translation. So that's kind of the beauty of the virtual memory. It couples these two completely independent things. While you're doing translation, you also look at access control and you say, oh, I don't have access to this page. So then you don't translate. You get an access protection fault and your process uh, gets kicked out. Uh, or uh, exception handler kicks in basically. Right? So as I said, virtual memory system serves two functions today, address translation for illusion of large physical memory, access control protection for clearly security and privacy purposes, right, in our systems. But keep that in mind, these are two independent things. Okay, so this is my nice picture <laughs> with translation and access control. I'm not as talented as many of you, so I have this writing. Okay, so uh, let's take a look at this. You, what we're doing is we're extending the page table entries with permission bits. So take a look at this. I mean, this is a crude way of looking at it, but it gives the idea. You have a virtual page zero, you're able to read it, but you're not able to write to it. And this is the physical address. You check the bits on each access during or during a page fault. If violated, you generate an exception. So TLB houses the page table entry, including the access control bits. If you're trying to write to a page that you don't have the right permission to, the processor generates an access control exception, and there's an exception handler that handles it clearly. Right? Okay, so let's take a look at it from a real perspective. Unfortunately, real life is not as nice as this ugly, unreal picture, let's say. The real life looks at this. So in, in x86, for example, you have four privilege levels. Three, two of them are not commonly used. Uh, basically, highest privilege is the operating system. It's called the supervisor. Lowest privilege is the user. And supervisor is kernel in modern terminology. And let's take a look at these bits and how they're specified. So now we're, you're looking at real page table entries, 32-bit entries. This is the page directory entry, first level, page table entry, second level. Each of them has 32 bits, as you can see. So this is a PDE. This is the address of the page table, second level table. And you can see there are some bits here. Read, write, can I read, write? Can, do I have supervisor level permissions? Do I need supervisor level permissions to access it? That's user supervisor bit. There's the access bit that we discussed. And there are a bunch of other stuff that you and I don't want to know about at this point. But you can see that there are some control bits over there that people add over time. Okay. And that's the page table, uh, address of the page table, uh, basically, next level page table. And you can see that it's called the flags in x86. And PTE, so this is, if you think about that, this is actually giving a coarser level. Uh, do I have access to that larger page, if you will, uh, this read write bit and user supervisor bit? But PTE also has these bits at a finer level. P remember, PDE is the first level, PTE is the second level. Uh, if this is a four kilobyte page, page table entry protects four kilobyte pages and PDE protects like much larger uh, pages. I think it's four megabytes. Yes, four megabytes. It should be four megabyte pages, basically. So you, can, you have protection at two different granularities, four megabytes and four kilobytes, right? And these could be different potentially, right? Read, write, and user supervisor, as you can see over here. That's your real physical frame number, physical page number, and these are the flags. Okay, let's take a look at this. Uh, so PDE's flags protect all 1,024 pages in a page table. 
And you can read this. This is actually the x86 manual. And the operating system needs to be aware of this again. Uh, there was a question earlier. The operating system sets these bits based on the permissions. And if operating system makes a mistake, user supervisor bits set to supervisor, you get supervisor level access to a system level page. That sounds bad. And a lot of potential uh, security attacks exploit this. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. PT also protects one page at a time. Now, if a mess happens, this is the combined. This is from the x86 manual also to help you, presumably. But basically, you have a page directory entry and page table entry, and they have different privilege levels and access types. And x86 tries to help you uh, in terms of what happens with different access types. There's a combined effect, as you can see over here. Yeah, it's not. Let's, uh, let me let me say that it's 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 interesting, but this this sort of stuff becomes a bit messy because you have protection at different levels right now, uh, and the bits need to be set consistently. Right? Okay, so okay now uh, my favorite part. <laughs> so what if your hardware is unreliable, for example, and can, someone can flip the access protection bits? Right. This is lecture two, if you remember, <laughs> and we're going to flip these bits and we're going to see exactly why, for example, row hammer works. Now we have actually all the background until. Uh, this point a user level program can gain supervisor level access uh, to memory meaning access to all data in the system by flipping the access control bit from user to supervisor of course this is extremely hard we're not going to do it that way we're going to do it in a much more convoluted way so that we can enable this attack to succeed so let's take a look at what that convoluted way is but can this happen hopefully your answer is yes right because you know about throw hammer and maybe you're bored of it okay you're bored of it <laughs> just kidding Okay, so you know about row hammer, so I'm not going to tell you that again. Uh, but let's take a look at how you can take advantage of it because we missed that, right? I said that you have these bit flips and someone can take over your system. The question is how? And we said that you can write this program to flip bits. Now, we actually, you know caches, uh, you know row buffers. Oh, sorry. So for, the, for these bit flips to happen, basically, you need to know about, know about microarchitecture a lot, right? Caches, row buffers, you need to bypass them so that you enable bit flips. Okay, fine. Uh, let's take a look at how Google actually did this. Remember, how many people remember this slide? So-so. Uh, okay, so-so. Maybe I'll quickly uh, mention this. So basically, uh, these Google folks, Project Zero folks, uh, showed that you could actually induce these bit flips and take over the system. What we showed in our work was actually, we basically said that someone can hijack your computer. We did not show a proof of concept. We said that you can, you can flip these bits and this should not happen. Why? Because memory isolation, now you know that, is a key property of a reliable and secure computing system. And access to one memory address should not have unintended side effects on data stored in other addresses. Right? And absolutely true. And virtual memory enables us to isolate memory. And access to one address does not have, in one process, does not have unintended side effects on uh, another page. Right? OK, so Google folks basically read our paper. They basically said, OK, we built some working privilege escalation exploits. And they can take, they essentially were able to induce bit flips to gain kernel level privilege to some uh, uh, as a user level program. And why? Because they were able to induce bit flips in their page table entries. And we're going to see that. Now you know what the page table entry means. So now you know how this works, right? As a result, this user level program was able to gain write access to its own page table. And now you know if you, if as a user level, you can gain write access to your own page table. What can you do? You can actually do a lot of things, right? You can change your permissions in the entire system because user should not gain access to its own page table. It can change all of the access control bits. And you know, because this is all ISA level thing, you know, this is all exposed to the user and operating systems also document how they do these things. Okay, let's talk about how, how Google did this. Uh, this. These are slides actually from uh, this beautiful Black Hat talk by uh, Mark Seaborn. I'm going to reuse them because it's nice. And uh, so basically, they say that page tables, page table entries are dense and trusted. They control access to physical memory. A bit flip in a page table entries physical page number can give a process access to different uh, physical page, basically. So their goal is to get access to a page table. And this way, they get access to all of the physical memory belonging to everyone. And their goal is to maximize the chances that a bit flip is useful. So uh, they're going to do something interesting. They're going to spray physical memory with page tables, and uh, they're going to basically find the first repeatable bit flip. So it's not an easy attack. 
so this is the x86 page table entry that I showed you, kind of. Uh, it's 64 bits, as you can see, and they have some information over here. They say basically they could flip a writable permission bit, read write, that we showed earlier. There's only one bit out of 64. So your chance is only 2% to succeed, right? But they also say, oh, I could actually flip bits in the physical page number. That's 20 bits on a four gigabyte system. And if I actually do that, I have a much bigger chance if I flip a bit over there and that gives me access to a page table. So let's take a look at how they do it. I think this is fascinating. And this sort of reverse engineering and security is very interesting in understanding a system. So this is the virtual address space, this is the physical memory. Uh, so they're gonna map a file. They're gonna map a file with read and write permissions. This is uh, the virtual address space, four kilobyte portion of the file. And this is the physical address space. File gets mapped physically. And then there's a translation. So these are the page table entries that control access to the file. And they have the write bit set, basically, because you open the file with the write enable. Okay, that's nice. Now they repeatedly map the file. Once you repeatedly map the file, the system is smart. It doesn't replicate the file in physical memory. It just replicates the mappings. So basically, you keep repeatedly opening the same file. This is what happens. You, the file is here, but you're, you're, you're filling up your virtual memory. Uh, the file is only in one page, let's say, uh, in physical memory or two pages. Uh, doesn't matter. But you have page table entries. You're filling up your physical memory with page table entries that are pointing to your file. Make sense? Because whenever you're reading or writing to the file, you need to go through those page table entries to do the read or write. Okay, sounds good. Eventually, you can fill all the physical memory with page table entries. That's what they do. And each of them points to pages in the same physical file mapping, which is this one. And if a bit in the right place in the PT flips, now the corresponding virtual address, this is the virtual address, it was originally pointing to the file because that's how, you, how the operating system securely mapped. Nice, no problem here. But if a bit flips, the corresponding virtual address now points to a wrong physical page with read write access. And what is in that wrong physical page? A page table entry. Does that make sense? Now you have read write permissions to your own page table entries. That's the idea. And chances are this wrong page contains a page table itself because they sprayed the main memory with page tables. Right? An attacker now uh, read write the page tables basically. And uh, they can use that to map any memory read write basically. They can basically do anything in the system. That's what they're saying over here. Okay, does that make sense? And they call it like seven easy steps. It's easy compared to many other attacks, actually, uh, because this is actually really going into the root of uh, security. They allocate a large chunk of memory. They search for, so initially they, they do something called templating the memory, meaning they search for locations that are prone to flipping, and they check if these locations fall into the right spot in a PTE so that they can allow the exploit, meaning in, the, in, in one of those 20 bits in the physical page number. So they need to do some pre-processing uh, so that they figure out what parts of the memory is vulnerable to row hammer attack. This is called templating the memory. And then, uh, this is all user level. Operating system is not aware of this, basically. Uh, and then they return, deallocate that memory, because they figured out that template. Uh, and uh, the operating system has, has it back. And they force the operating system to reuse that memory uh, by doing this uh, uh, opening of the pay, uh, opening of the uh, files in memory many, many times, right? For PTEs. So they're at some point, the operating system is going to map a PTE to that memory that they know is vulnerable to a bit. So a lot of things need to happen, of course, for this to work, but they made it work. And then they cause a bit flip, they shift the uh, page table entry to point into the page table, and then they abuse the read-write access. The important part is the write access to all the physical memory. But even read access is bad, right? Read access, even if you don't have write access, read access is bad because you read someone's data that you're not supposed to read. It could belong to, for example, a private key that happens to be in memory, right? That you're not supposed to have access to. But write access is much more malicious, of course, right? And that's the idea. And you can see the last sentence over here. In practice, there are many complications and clearly any security attack has this sort of complication. So now hopefully you know exactly how an exploit works uh, and we've kind of covered I don't know, 24 lectures, <laughs> and hopefully it's clear. And I like talking about row hammers, you know. <laughs> okay, so all of these attacks, these are actually very fascinating attacks. A lot of them are based on this basic thing, but they actually improve things in different ways. 
which I'm not going to go into. Some of them actually uh, cannot take over the system, but they read private data, for example. So they're very interesting attacks, actually. I would recommend you take a look at them if you're interested. Okay, so there's a lot more. Uh, and you know that actually there's a lot of issues with Rohammer. So and Google actually introduced another Rohammer attack uh, six years later after their original one, where they showed that they can actually induce these bit flips in a much more sophisticated and easy way, let's say. And you can see that, I mean, I'm, again, I'm not going to talk about it since we don't have time, but uh, it's fascinating that people are, even people at Google are actually introducing new attacks right now. And if you're interested, there's more, and I'm happy to talk more. But I like this picture that was driven, <laughs> that was <laughs> drawn by one of your uh, creative <laughs> colleagues, Malti, over there. Uh, I think maybe I should stop talking about Rohammer so that I'm, drawn, I'm not drawn like this, but I like it, I think. <laughs> okay. Okay, so let me, uh, I think we don't have a lot of time, but let me give you the takeaway and food for thought, uh, which since we don't have time, we're not going to cover a lot of remaining virtual memory. And if you're in need of such pictures, I think you can commission multi to, uh, uh, but probably you need to uh, uh, offer her a good price, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, basically, my, my takeaway, I think, from all of this is if hardware is unreliable, so all of this mechanism we built, virtual memory, right? it's such a complex system. We need to rethink it in different ways. But even, uh, even that doesn't work, right? If hardware is unreliable, all of these higher level security and protection mechanisms may be compromised, right? So this means that if you think about it very fundamental, the root of security and trust is really, really at the very, very, very low levels. It's not at the software. It's really at the very low levels of the hardware. If the hardware doesn't provide you the sort of trust or security, then you basically have, let's say, no guarantees. And Rohammer is an example, Spectre and Meltdown are other examples also. So I think these are very good questions to maybe part with. What should we assume the hardware provides? How do we keep the hardware reliable? How do we design secure hardware? And how do you design secure hardware with high performance, high energy efficiency, low cost and convenient programming? And these are actually really real issues uh, that will affect us going into the future because Hardware is becoming increasingly unreliable as we talked earlier. And that is going to affect this secure root of security of, and trust. And I think security in general is a very global concern. I don't include privacy even here, it's just assumed, right? There's security, privacy, and trust. And there are many, plenty of exciting and highly relevant research questions. And virtual memory lecture is really a great place to discuss this. Okay, so I have a lot of slides that I'm not gonna cover. <laughs> but let me uh, go into this slide very quickly so that we can finish virtual memory. You can look at these slides or you look at last year's lecture. There are a lot of other issues in virtual memory that we did not cover. Uh, complicated systems today, you can also find that. Uh, but let me summarize over here. This is the one slide summary of virtual memory, if you will. Uh, you get the illusion of infinite capacity, you get memory protection, and you get a lot of hardware software cooperation and a lot of complexity to provide that illusion and protection. And that's not even simple. If you have virtualized systems, there's another level of virtualization. So if you thought we did not have enough levels of indirection, if you have a virtual machine on top of your OS operating system, that virtual machine introduced another level of virtual memory system, and your five levels of access become 10 levels of access now. So maybe I'll leave you with this. Okay, let me finish with this one, sorry, since I have your attention now. This is actually, even though it's such a mess, it's one of the most successful examples of architectural support for programmers, how to partition work between hardware and software and hardware software cooperation and pro program architect trade-off. But going forward, actually, it's, going, it's not scaling very well because you have huge memory sizes, local and remote, hybrid physical memory systems, DRAM and VM SSD, they all may map to memory, actually. There are many accelerators that are accessing this physical memory and virtual memory also. And these virtualized systems like hypervisor, system software, virtualization, local and remote memories. So it's becoming very, very difficult to keep uh, uh, efficiency with these huge levels of translation. And people are figuring this out right now, actually. Uh, this is one paper that I mentioned that I recommended. If you're interested, you can also watch. Nostran recently got her PhD uh, in my group, and her thesis was on actually rethinking virtual memory. And you can take a look at it if you're interested. And there's a lot more to discuss on virtual memory, but we don't have time. Hopefully you will discuss some of this in systems programming uh, lectures because systems programming, you cannot uh, discuss, uh, you cannot have a systems programming uh, course and do systems programming without going through virtual memory. 
maybe you will see some of these issues in a lot more detail and uh, have some headaches with virtual memory. <laughs> it happens. Okay, since you guys want to stay, I'm happy to go, go continue, but I think this is a good place to stop. Any questions, thoughts? Okay, so uh, I'm not going to see you much. Maybe I'm going to see you during the exam, but uh, until the exam, what we're going to do is we're going to release some uh, question answering session, problem solving sessions, let's say. Some of them will be purely online, but we intend to hold another program problem solving session in a hybrid manner, just like this lecture. So if you're interested in attending, uh, we're going to have a survey on when that will happen. Is that correct, Mohammed? Yes. Uh, that survey, uh, please respond if you want to attend it. I mean, of course, you can always watch it afterwards like we've been doing, so no problem. Uh, and then we're going to also uh, have released one video about how to, let's say, prepare for the exam. But uh, I think you kind of know that. You just solve the questions in the homework, and you will have some of the solutions done by the TS. Not for all of the problems, of course, but a good subset of the problems. Uh, I mean, hopefully, uh, most importantly, regardless of whatever you do in the future, hopefully this course was useful for your critical thinking about ideas. Uh, I could have taught this course in a way that basically says, okay, this is how it's designed and good luck, that's the future. But I prefer like questioning all of these things because all of these things may be different 20 years down the road. Uh, and what you take away from that is what matters. Any questions on the exam or anything, logistics? Okay, then we're done. Thanks for your attention and take care. Maybe I'll see you in some future courses. <laughs>